Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for coming to this session of the Perth Writers' Festival. I'm Stephen Rome, the literary editor of The Australian, and with me today for this session titled The Yellow Birds is the author of the book of that name, Kevin Powers. So what we're going to do to start out with is Kevin's going to read a bit from this novel. I'll just briefly introduce it in a sense. Uh, Kevin was born and raised in Richmond, Virginia. He enlisted in the US Army when he was 17. And in 2004, he did a year's tour of duty in Iraq uh, in a combat unit uh, as a machine gunner. And this book, The Yellow Birds, stems from that experience. So Kevin's now going to read from it. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy that you all joined us here today. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to come. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm just going to read a short passage. The book uh, essentially is a story of two soldiers, uh, one of whom makes a pledge to look out for the other. and. Uh, what happens when he is not able to, to keep that. It's not a spoiler. Um, on page eight, you find out that, uh, that one of the soldiers doesn't survive the time in Iraq. So <clears throat> the passage I'm going to read takes place when the narrator has returned back uh, to Virginia. And he's sort of reflecting on um, the, the grief that he feels um, with regard to the loss of, of his friend. Uh, and if I can just find the passage here, I will get going. I sat down there a while until the sun was straight above me and the light fell down in wide columns and sweat ran down between my shoulder blades. I decided then to walk the tracks toward the city. <laughs> shall, I, shall I wait a minute till the helicopter goes by? Yeah. You're right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, OK. I decided then to walk the tracks toward the city. It wasn't so much a decision as it was a product of trying to turn off my mind. I couldn't stop thinking about Murph. I drifted and followed the guidance of the tops of my boots. And I tried not to think. And when I got back up to the porch, I wiped the sweat from my forehead, opened the sliding door, put a few things in my duffel bag, and left. I hadn't known what I was doing then, but my memories of Murph were a kind of misguided archaeology. Sifting through the remains of what I remembered about him was a denial of the fact that a hole was really all that was left, an absence I had attempted to reverse, but found that I could not. There was simply not enough material to account for what had been removed. The closer I got to reconstructing him in my mind, the more the picture I was trying to recreate receded. For every memory I was able to pull up, another seemed to fall away forever. There was some proportion about it all, though. It was like putting a puzzle together from behind. The shapes familiar, the picture quickly fading, the muted tan of the cardboard backing a tease at wholeness and completion. I think of a time when we sat in the evening in the guard tower, watching the war go by in streaks of red and green and other briefer lights. And he'd tell me of an afternoon in the little hillside apple orchard that his mother worked, the turn and flash of a paring knife along a wrap of gauze as they grafted uppers to rootstocks and new branches to blossom, or the time he saw but could not explain his awe when his father brought a dozen caged canaries home from the mine and let them loose in the hollow where they lived, how the canaries only flitted and sang a while before perching back atop their cages, which had been arranged in rows his father likely thinking that the birds would not return by choice to their captivity and that the cages should be used for something else, a pretty bed for vegetables, perhaps a place to string up candles between the trees. And in what strange silences the world worked, Murph must have wondered as the birds settled peaceably in their formation and ceased to sing. And I'd try to recall things until nothing came, which I quickly found was my only certainty until what was left of him was a sketch in shadow, a skeleton falling apart, and my friend Murph was no more friend to me than the strangest stranger. My missing him became a grave that could not be filled or leveled, just a faded blemish in a field, 
and a damn poor substitute for grief, as graves so often are. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I mean, for those of you who haven't read the book, I recommend it most highly. It's a beautiful book. It's a book about how war destroys the men who fight it, physically, of course, but also emotionally. And that description, that understanding of the emotional devastation of, of soldiers is just about the best I think I've read. So what I wanted to ask you to start with, Kevin, is to explain the title. I think we should get that out of the way. And uh, let me tell you that you're allowed to swear <laughs> at literary events yeah. when you're talking about literature. So why is it called The Yellow Birds? Uh, so the, the title comes from a, a marching cadence, probably well, if not the, it's, it's among the most common uh, marching cadences in, in the US military. And it, uh, it has many, uh, many different variations, but, uh, but it begins with the yellow birds. Uh, the yellow bird with the yellow bill was perched upon my windowsill. I lured him in with a piece of bread, and then I smashed his fucking head. Um, so in a sense, that was the way that I was introduced to the military to what it meant, uh, what it meant to be a soldier, uh, what would be expected of me, the kind of attitude that was, uh, I suppose, in a way, encouraged. Uh, it's the first uh, marching cadence I can remember singing when I arrived at basic training in uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, uh, as a 17-year-old. And and I just thought when I, you know when I was writing this story and thinking about the kind of story that I wanted to tell. I, I felt like introducing the reader to what these characters would experience um, by demonstrating the kind of, um, you know, the conflict between the sort of fra fragile nature of, of life and the kind of the callous nature of the violence that you encounter every day. It, it seemed like this was a, a good choice to put uh, right at the beginning before the story started. And so why, why at 17 did you decide to enlist in the US Army? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I suppose it's difficult to, to pinpoint a, one single reason. Um, you know, I, I was not a good student in high school. Um, my prospects seemed um, rather limited at the time. Um, I, I, I wouldn't have gotten into a university then, certainly, and even if I had, it would have been difficult for us to pay for it. Um, but, but, you know, I also come from a family in which military service is uh, somewhat common. Uh, so my father had served in the Army, my uncle had been a Marine. Both of my grandfathers fought during the Second World War. Um, so, you know, there was a kind of a, practic a combination of, of the practical and the idealistic. I thought, well, this will be an opportunity for me to uh, serve my country and, uh, uh, you know, also hopefully get a university education out of it. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, you know, the place where I come from, it's, it's not all that unusual. I mean, I think a fair amount of, uh, of the US military comes from uh, backgrounds that are not dissimilar to mine, kind of a rural part of the country, um, you know, middle class to sort of lower middle class. So, uh, I mean, it seemed like a natural decision at the time. And when, when you enlisted, did you enlist hoping that you would get sent overseas, hoping that you would see combat? No, I mean, I wouldn't say, I certainly wouldn't say that I was hoping to. Um, I, I mean, I understood that it was a possibility, and, and eventually I understood that it was a, a, a certainty. Um, no, it's, it, you know, it's one of those things where it's, I think particularly when you're, when you're as young as I was and you're fairly naive, um, the idea that it will happen seems so incredibly abstract. And then when you, when you accept the fact that it will happen, the idea that um, anything bad will happen to you just seems um, so distant. It seems like, well, if anything bad happens, it'll happen to somebody else. And I think that's kind of the, you know, most uh, young men have a, have a kind of sense of their own invincibility in a way. That the youth is something that really comes through in this book. And even though we all know that it's young men who fight wars, this sort of reminds you of that, and Murph particularly, 
there's a line in there where you, the narrator Bartle realizes that he's never shaved. Right. And it's, it sort of reminds you, doesn't it, that these wars are fought by very young men. It was something I consciously wanted to emphasize. I mean, I, I, I very often refer to them as boys, and that's a decision that I made. Um, the, you know, the, this moment of realization that uh, that Bartle has when he sees that uh, you know Murph just has peach fuzz, and uh, you know Bartle's only uh, <clears throat> 21, but he feels vastly older than uh, than Murph. So it was something that I really wanted to make sure came came through when somebody read the book. And when you when you did get to Iraq in 2004, could anything have prepared you for what? you ended up doing and seeing? Um, well, it's funny. I mean, yes and no. So the, the military, the US military, and I'm sure militaries across the world have gotten very good at, uh, at, at training people to do the things that they're requiring them to do. But um, the kind of shock to the system, uh, the, the visceral nature of what you encounter, and the, you know, the effect that it will have on you as a, as a human being, that's something that you simply can't prepare for. So kind of on a functional level, yes, you end up being able to, to perform in spite of that, but you know, it's the repercussions trying to get out of that mindset that, uh, that there is no preparation for. Mm -hmm. Well, just to follow up on that, I might just, I might just read you a little bit of the book and, <laughs> and ask, and then ask you to talk about, about this bit because I thought it was, um, was particularly, particularly relevant. I can find it myself. Okay, here we are. So this is the narrator Bartle thinking about what happens when soldiers return home. And he says, um, every, and I'm gonna to have to swear here as well. Everybody is so fucking happy to see you, the murderer, the fucking accomplice, the at bare minimum bearer of some fucking responsibility. And everyone wants to slap you on the back and you start to want to burn down the whole goddamn country. You want to burn every goddamn yellow ribbon in sight and you can't explain it, but it's just like, fuck you. But then you signed up to it. So it's all to go, so it's all your fault really, because you went on purpose, so you are in the end doubly fucked. So why not just find a spot and call up and die and let's make it as painless as possible because you are a coward and really cowardice got you into this mess because you wanted to be a man and people made fun of you and pushed you around in the cafeteria and the hallways in high school because you liked to read books and poems sometimes and they'd call you a fag and really deep down you know you went because you wanted to be a man and that's never going to happen now. Is that how you feel? Well, I was certainly in a position where I could imagine feeling that way, and, and, and to a degree, I've felt similar, you know, kind of anger and resentment and confusion of, of, a, of a variety that's not all that different from, from that. No, I mean, in, in that, you know, and in that moment in the book, the narrator has been kind of throughout, it takes, the, takes place, you know, kind of looking back on his own experience, and he's trying to have some control over his memories, have some control over his emotions, um, find a way to kind of place all these disparate events into a, a story that makes sense. And, you know, the moment um, that kind of instigates this, this line of uh, this kind of outpouring of, of anger and, and uh, shame, um, you know, it's the moment when he recognizes that he doesn't have any control over his, his past. and. Uh, the confusion is something that I absolutely felt myself. The, uh, the kind of mixed messages that you get from uh, the, the kind of larger civilian population. Um, and it can be, it can be profoundly um, difficult to comprehend the, the, the grave nature of your predicament. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that comes through clearly in the book, the, the complexity of the emotions felt by the narrator Bartle. And, and shame and guilt are certainly high among them, aren't they? They, they are, no, and I mean, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I wanted to make sure that, uh, I, you, know, you know, at least in the, in the US, historically, the reaction toward the military has been, you know, has followed two, two tracks. It's, it's either been valorization 
um, or it's been demonization. And, and I really wanted to approach these characters, particularly the narrator, as, as, a, as an individual with a you know, kind of complex set of responses to the experience that he's had. Um, I didn't want to excuse the things that he had participated in, um, but I didn't necessarily want to, want to condemn him for, for having <laughs> participated in these things uh, without really trying to, to understand them. Uh, he has a hard time not condemning himself for the things that he's, he's been involved in, uh, even, even if it's simply uh, kind of a matter of, of having witnessed some of these things that, uh, that he takes this sort of responsibility for. Um, yeah, but these are, you know, war is, is the worst, probably the worst thing that a person can be involved in, and the recognition of that, that, uh, that you have been involved in that and that you will never be a person who hasn't been involved in that um, can lead to, to powerful feelings of, of shame and regret and guilt, absolutely. One of the things that struck me from the, the very beginning of the book was you often read war stories, you see war films, and there's the sense of the, the soldiers as brothers sticking together. And whilst that comes through in your book, there's also a very strong sense that they don't want to be the one who dies. Right. And more than that, they want someone else to be the one who dies. And there's a certain discussion about they're coming up towards a thousand casualties in Iraq, and no one wants to be that thousandth casualty. Can you just talk about that a bit? Because I think it's quite unusual right. to, to the layman. <clears throat> well, I mean, again, I mean, we, I think one of the things that uh, out in the culture is this idea that there's this unbreakable uh, sort of bond between soldiers, the, which, which is to a degree true. But one of the things that I felt didn't get uh, really any attention was this idea that the instinct toward self-preservation doesn't go away. Um, and of course, you could certainly hope that nothing bad ever happened to anybody. But you are in a war, so there's an understanding that bad things are going to happen. And there's a kind of, you know, this thing that is never spoken, that is never talked about, but that I hope it's not me. And, you know, whatever else has to happen for it to not be me, you're okay with that. I mean, you end up making those kinds of, um, of negotiations with yourself. And that, in turn, can, can kind of compound the the shame that you feel, it, it does feel like you're, you're sort of um, going against everything that you're, you've been told you're supposed to feel, these ideas that you should uh, always be willing to sacrifice yourself. And, and, and I think those sacrifices are made. People do make those sacrifices, and those bonds are real. But underneath it, there is this desperate desire to survive. Um, and, and people do feel a significant amount of shame as a result of that, I think. So you, you did your, your year in, in Iraq and, and you came back to mm -hmm. the States and I think you, you went to university and did your degree and then you did a master's in fine arts, well you've recently completed a master's yeah. in fine arts. Um, so at what point did you decide to turn your experiences in Iraq into a, into a novel? It was about two years after uh, I got back. I didn't immediately go to university, I, uh, I worked a few jobs. I was. You know, kind of framing houses for a while, and then I worked at a credit card company. Um, you know, and I started writing poems again. I'd, I'd been writing uh, poems and, and, you know, kind of prose fiction since I was a teenager. Uh, I didn't do it while I was overseas, but when I got back, I started writing poetry that sort of dealt with the war. And these ideas kept appearing. I, I, I recognized that I had concerns that were. Um, rather specific um, questions about my own experience that I wanted to explore. Um, so about two years after I got back, you know, I started writing a story and the story kept getting longer. Um, and at some point I kind of admitted to myself that I was writing a novel. Um, and I think by then I, had, I, I was back in, in university, so I had um, kind of a little more time um, than, I, than I'd had when I was working to, to focus on it. And uh, yeah, so it was about two years 
So it would been to sometime in 2007 when I sort of decided that, okay, I am going to try to put this into a novel. And, and how long from that point to the novel being completed? Um, four years, yeah. And, uh, you know, so of course I was trying to get a degree. I was, uh, you know, living my life. So it certainly wasn't a, a kind of four years of eight hours a day every single day, but over the course of four years, dedicating as much time as, as I could, um, you know, the book was ultimately finished, yeah. And I've seen interviews where you've said that uh, people always ask you what was it like over there and you say that the, one of the purposes of this book is to answer a different question, which is how it felt, I think. Is right, well, I re yeah, I mean, it seemed to me that um, the, the question wasn't so much about trying to kind of gather information. So, so it wasn't a question based on a lack of understanding of the kind of um, you know, if somebody wants to, to see a firefight, they can go on YouTube. Um, these things are on TV, you know, well, for a time they were on TV every single day. There were, uh, there was excellent reporting being done about the, the kind of information about what was happening in the war. So it seemed to me that what people were asking was kind of a question of a different kind, which was the sort of more experiential, you know, what did it feel like, uh, what do you feel like now? Um, and it just seemed that that sort of what was it like, this very broad question was a way of getting at that. Um, perhaps without, without the people asking it, even really knowing that that's what they, what they were really asking about, the sort of uh, the interior life of, of the soldier, the interior life of the veteran. Um, that's not something that you can go on YouTube and, and find out about, you know? And I think it seems to me anyway that, uh, that literature and art is one of the, the best ways to reveal that aspect of uh, the human condition, as it were. Yes, I mean, you could have written a memoir, I suppose, of your experiences. So why did you decide to make it a work of fiction? Yeah, I mean, I suppose in a way I needed, the, um, I needed a certain degree of distance from my own experience to have uh, the kind of perspective that I wanted to tell the story, to, to have the kind of clarity that I wanted. Um, and, and one of the ways that I felt like I could achieve that distance was by using uh, the imagination. Um, and because, the, you know, I had this sort of notion that um, people were interested in, in, in trying to find uh, a way to empathize with uh, the soldiers who were going, going through experiences, probably not too unlike um, uh, Bartles and Murphs and Sergeant Sterling's. I mean, I, I personally have this feeling that, uh, you know, empathy is something that begins in the imagination. Uh, you have to be able to imagine yourself into another person's life. And it just seemed to me that, uh, that a fictional story would provide access to that in a way that perhaps my own wouldn't. And those characters you mentioned, Murph and, and Sergeant Sterling, who's an extraordinary character, and we, we won't reveal, for those who haven't read it, you know, the, the major plot sort of right. developments, but he's someone who fail, not fail, sorry, but he's someone who ha has that guilt about not being the one who dies in, in a surprising way in the end. Are, were those, are those characters close to men you knew in, in, the, in Iraq, in the army? Well, the, you know, there aren't any people that I served with that correspond directly to the characters in the book, but I think, you know, a combination of um, elements of, uh, of, of people's personalities, including my own, and they're kind of a, an, an amalgamation in a way of, of uh, these different ways of approaching uh, the experience of war, different, different sort of strategies t uh, to survive. Um, different kind of weaknesses. Uh, yeah, so it was kind of a, a combination of, of, you know, my own experience, my own uh, questions and uh, interactions with a large number of other people that I had that, that led to these, these specific characters. Because um, the book, the fictional story, takes a much darker turn than your own story did. Yeah. It was, 
what, why, why did you decide to take it to such a dark place in a work of fiction? Well, I mean, it, you know, I was looking for a way to, to sort of distill the, 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 the kind of terrible um, impact that war has on, on a person's life. And it seemed to me by, by kind of focusing all of the energy in, into this one sort of event that happens uh, toward the end, it just seemed that that would be a way that would be kind of practical for a reader to sort of get, I, I hoped anyway, to get the kind of full force of that. Um, but also it seemed that um, it was a way of um, focusing the kind of tension of the sort of story in a way that I, I thought would be interesting. Um, so as, as we've said, I mean, it, very, very early on, we know that one of the characters is not going to make it. But I wanted to find a different way to, to, to kind of engage the reader to, to keep going to find out what, what, the, what, what the main question of the story is. Um, so I sort of focused on this one event as being the sort of um, way of looking at what really causes the sort of damage that, uh, that many of these, these guys coming back have to deal with. Well, you certainly do that. I mean, you, um, you read the book just, you know something terrible has happened and you have to wait to the end to find out what it is and it, 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 it certainly works. But throughout the book, this is in the back of your mind as you're reading it, but on almost every page in the Iraq sequences, mm. there is this, this casual horror, you know, headless bodies, people rotting in the river, uh, that sort of thing. And it, it, just to a reader like, like myself who's never seen a war, you read that and you, you must think, how, how, how did you survive it and how, how do you sort of reconcile having seen all of that with a, a normal existence? Well, that is the question. I mean, that, that, that is kind of one of the primary questions that I wanted to look at in the book. Um, and, and I wanted to set up that, that, that I wanted that dip, that the, the kind of difference between the way that it becomes commonplace during the war and the impact that it has on you after. I mean, I wanted to focus on the way that it's sort of set in such a stark relief. You know, as human beings, we have an incredible capacity to adapt to almost any environment. Um, it doesn't matter how, how horrible it is. And it's not just um, related to war. People have endured incredibly tragic um, circumstances in their lives. Um, and somehow they managed to kind of carry on in a way. Um, very often, much later, the, the kind of the consequences of, of that adaptation, that ability to adapt to our environment, um, can be can be more damaging perhaps than the, the the initial events that sort of caused it. I mean, for for a soldier in particular, you sort of become in a way acclimatized to this violence. But when you get when you get home, um, and that adaptation is no longer useful. It becomes, uh, it becomes a, a, I mean, it, it's, it's really debilitating. It, you know, when you're, when you're kind of, let's say you're sitting somewhere in Virginia and uh, every fiber of your being is conditioned to expect violence to, um, to in a way, participate in violence. Um, when, when that becomes your new normal, when the kind of the center of your worldview has shifted to this incredibly horrific um, set of experiences, the normal world becomes as foreign as the war would have been before you went. Uh, and it's really difficult to, to kind of realign in that way. That comes through very clearly in the book. It's almost as though there are two battlefronts, the one in Iraq and the one when you get back home. Yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think, you know, particularly given the way that we're beginning to understand um, the real consequences of, uh, you know, the, the fact that there is a direct line between uh, putting young men and women in, in these situations and the, the kind of psychological consequences that they experience, um, you know, we can't, uh, we can't 
I don't think we're in a place anymore where we can say, oh, that, that's a kind of weakness of character or, um, or uh, you know, th that person wasn't cut out for it. I mean, this is what results when you send people to war. They're damaged. Um, yeah, so. How do you stay in touch with people from your army days? Are you still part of the military culture? I'm not part of the military culture, um, but I do, I do keep in touch with um, a couple of the guys that I was really close to. Yeah, but they have, they have also moved on uh, to, to other, uh, other, parts of, of, uh, other parts of the world that don't involve the military one bit. So, but we do keep in touch, yeah. And have any of your comrades read the book? They have, yeah. And what do they think? Well, they're biased in a way. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, you know they're they're. Uh, I think they're they're proud of me. They're they're happy that uh, they're happy that I've sort of been able to to do the thing that that they knew that I wanted to do. Um, there, there. I, I expect that there is probably as diverse a response uh, among soldiers that I don't know who have read it um, as as there is in the kind of population at large. But uh, but at least the guys I know who have read it liked it. So. That's all right with me, yeah. So um, you, you mentioned that it took about four years to write the novel. So what, what happened next? I mean, you weren't a published writer. I wasn't. How did you go about getting this, this book about the Iraq war published? Uh, well, somebody told me, uh, you know, somebody said, I, I know a place where you can send it. And, uh, and I sent it to, to, one, to one agent. And he said, thanks, but no thanks. And then I sent it to another agent, and he said that he really liked it. And I was happy about that. And uh, yeah, and then he said, you know, give me some time to, to try to get it in the hands of publishers. And, uh, and it worked out. Um, I know I'm, I'm fortunate in that respect that, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't take as long as, as I perhaps thought it might. But, uh, you know, I didn't really have that many expectations. I, I, I wrote it without. You know, when I finished it, I was doing a, a, a master's degree in poetry. The idea that I would be a published novelist wasn't really um, one that uh, was kind of at the forefront of my mind. I wrote it because I wanted to write it. I felt like it was important for me to, to explore the ideas that I had. I hoped that perhaps if I finished it that uh, there might be a few people who would be interested in taking a look at it. So yeah, I mean, I, I'm... Uh, I, I recognize my, my good fortune uh, in that respect, and that, that people do seem to have responded to it, and I, I appreciate that a great deal. Yeah. It, was, it, um, was it a big edit? Was it a long time in the editing process, or did it more or less get published as you, as you wrote it? I, I mean, there, there certainly, it, yeah, there, there wasn't a, a significant edit with regard to kind of the you know, large changes in the material, but there were some conversations about um, uh, taking certain approaches in, in very specific instances in the book. Um, so it took some time, um, but it wasn't a, you know, it didn't change profoundly from when I sent it in to my publisher and uh, the way it appears now. Yeah. And, I mean, have you been pleasantly, I imagine, surprised by the, the response, the critical response? I mean, it's been extremely well received. I have been, of course. Yeah, I mean, as I said, you know, I, 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 you know, I wish I could claim that I, that I expected this kind of response, but I, but I didn't. You know, I, I, I wrote a very large portion of this book, you know, late at night, in a very small apartment in Austin, Texas. Um, you know, so the idea that, uh, yeah, that uh, you know, I'd be sitting here in uh, beautiful Perth, Australia, talking to you lovely people. Um, that never occurred to me, uh, I have to be honest with you. I, I kind of, I thought maybe one person will, will be interested in it and will appreciate the work that I put into it. And if that happens, then I'll, then I'll be satisfied. Uh, so obviously, that, uh, you know, what's happening now is really beyond anything I could have prepared for. So. Do you think there's a, there's a thirst amongst particularly the American reading public for 
these sort of works on these wars that the country is involved in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I noticed, for example, that you were shortlisted for the, um, the National Book Award and also shortlisted was uh, Billy Flynn's Long Halftime Walk, which right. is a book about the first Gulf War, I think. Pretty no, sure. no, it's about... It's about the one, you, the yeah, same yeah, one, yeah. is it? Yeah. Okay. So you had two, two Iraq war novels uh, shortlisted for one of the most prestigious prizes in, in the US. Do you think that there is, this, is an appetite to know more about it? Yeah, I, mean, I think we've been at it so long with, with uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. That I think now we're getting to, to a point where people um, are beginning to be open to a kind of reflection about uh, what the consequences were, um, why we were there. So yeah, I mean, I think there is a, a, a new degree of interest and, it, it, you know, I don't know if it's just kind of a natural reaction to, to the situation, but it does seem that it's very hard to, to kind of reflect and, and take a step back while it's happening. Um, so, you know, we're involved in, in kind of intense fighting, and I say we as a, as a, as a kind of uh, society at large for, for many years. Um, and now that, uh, at least with respect to Iraq, some time has passed since we've had really major involvement. It seems like um, the opportunity for, for kind of reflection um, has presented itself, and I think people are, are taking advantage of that, so. Mm. Uh, were you conscious of sort of previous uh, war literature? Uh, have you been a reader of, of the great war books? I mean, there is a strong tradition of this, particularly in the US, books like The Things They Carried. And, uh, is it something that interested you separately to, to your own experiences? No, I mean, you know, when I was younger, um, I certainly read some books that had war as a, as a primary concern. Um, I don't know if I was attracted to them for that reason. Uh, so, for instance, I remember uh, the first time I read A Farewell to Arms, um, it, it had a really powerful effect on me. I'm not sure if it was due to the kind of nature of the subject or just because it's, I, I think it's such an extraordinary book. After I got back, I did, you know, I, I did have an interest in engaging with this literature because, I, you know, in my, in my life, it's the way I've sort, I've sort of best understood the world that I live in. I mean, this is what I go to when I have questions about my, my existence. You know, my, how, what, what does it mean to be, to be a person? What does it mean to, to care about the world? I, I go to books and, and to poetry to, to figure this stuff out. So being a veteran, having the kind of concerns that I had, having the questions that I had, I read uh, poets like Yusef Komanyaka, who's an American uh, Vietnam veteran. I, read uh, The Things They Carried. Uh, there's a really brilliant, strange book by a writer named Stephen Wright called Meditations in Green. Um, and there's a, a poet named Brian Turner who is an Iraq vet, and I encountered his book, and I was really um, excited by the fact that other people were, you know, it's just one of the things that literature does is, is lets us know that we're not alone. So in that respect, it was really important to, to to find this stuff for me, yeah. Can I just ask you, you know, what you now think from this distance about the US engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan? In the book, one of the characters, when it all turns bad, right. says, it's just a shitty little war. Right. You know? And there's another bit, though, where a colonel is addressing the troops before they're about to go into a, an action. And he says, you're about to do the most important thing you'll ever do in your lives such extreme right, right. viewpoints. So, what, you know, how do you feel about it you know, all this time later? Well, I mean, it, you know, it does seem to me, uh, and it's having been there, having experienced that, my, my response varies frequently. But the thing that I've settled on and the thing that perhaps is most troubling to me is this, it doesn't seem to have been necessary. I think, I, you know, I don't know if it would have been easier, but but uh, I wish if I had, it, you know, if I had had to go through all that, the people I was there with had had to experience what they experienced, all the lives that were lost, 
all the damage that was done to the to the to the country that we were in, to the the local people. Um, I wish that it had been necessary, and I just can't find a way to to accept the fact that it was. I, I just don't think it was necessary. It doesn't seem like we needed to be there. Yeah. Well, thanks. You're working on a new book? I am. Well, I have a, I have a book of uh, poetry that will be out um, next spring. And uh, right now I'm just kind of reading and taking notes. I have uh, an idea that is taking shape for another novel. Um, and this summer um, I plan on really Diving, diving back into to that and spending my time trying to work out those problems. Will this um, new novel be like a, a light romantic comedy? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no, no. So I'm, you know, I, I, I imagine I probably will always be um, concerned with uh, questions of violence and, and justice. I happen to be from a, from a place where uh, those tensions uh, are still very present. Um, so, you know, I grew up uh, in a house that, uh, you know, s s sat, sat on the grounds of an old uh, plantation. So I'm interested in the history of, uh, uh, of kind of slavery in America, um, the way that, that uh, the kind of residue of that still affects uh, our country. So I'm going to look at. Uh, as currently constituted, I, it, I think it's going to be about uh, the murder of a plantation owner just after the U.S. Civil War ends. But it may turn out to be a light romantic comedy. I don't know. So, yeah. Probably one or the other, though. <laughs> right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll take questions from the audience fairly soon. But I just thought I'm, you just mentioned justice. And I, I wanted to ask you a question that's not directly related to your own experience. But I wanted to ask you about drone warfare. Mm. And because you have a new uh, head of the CIA coming in in the US, and he needs to be confirmed by the, by the Congress. And I wonder what you, as a, as a person who served in the military, thinks about the use of unmanned drones operated not by soldiers, but by CIA operatives to kill people and people around them. Yeah. Well, I mean, You know, I think I, I like to think that um, you know that the people in uh, in the U.S. government are are trying to find the kind of best out of a number of really bad options. Um, I think if if and I know it's a big if, but if the use of these drones are a way to prevent both uh, civilian and military casualties, and I know that that's certainly not always the case. But if the choice is between sending 500,000 armed American soldiers and Marines into a country, attempting to occupy that country, and dealing with the inevitable kind of guerrilla warfare that will result from that, or on the alternative, sending a drone that will hopefully be able to um, deal with a specific target, you know, I, those are not ideal, neither of those are ideal, but, um, you know, I think, I understand why they think that using the drone would be preferable to sending half a million soldiers halfway around the world. Uh, on the other hand, I'm, I'm, I'm much less comfortable with the idea that, uh, that they can use these drones to target um, Americans without uh, trial, which is something that's uh, causing quite a stir, as well it should. Um, the government actually is not supposed to be able to kill its own citizens without, uh, without a trial. And even, I'm, I'm generally opposed to kind of the death penalty in general. But uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I am uncomfortable with it. But um, I'm much more uncomfortable with uh, with the kind of habit that we have seemed to have of, of, of sending big armies to places where I don't know that we belong. Okay, thanks. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes, so if we have questions from the audience now, and if you just wait, please, for the mic to come to you, and I'll, I'll, so there's a lady right at the front, perhaps we'll start with her, then we'll go to that gentleman, and then lady down the back there. I wondered, uh, is this on? Not on? Yes, it is. Mm. Um, 
about your experience or your view of the US military machine in terms of its psychological rehabilitation when you come back? Um, are they, in your opinion, are they equipped to deal and are they becoming better at dealing with modern warfare experience? Right. Um, I think they're, they're making genuine efforts to, to improve um, the kind of care that's, that's both available um, to, uh, to returning veterans. Uh, one of the problems is the, the culture that exists in the military. So one of the, one of the things that, that's really problematic is getting people to take advantage of the care that does exist. The, you know, the, the, I mean, there are resources in place. That they're not perfect by any means. Um, and I think, as I said, I think they are trying to figure out ways to make it more effective. But one of the, it seems to me, one of the chief impediments is, is this idea that is probably universal in the armed services that um, seeking help is a sign of weakness. And, and I don't know if that's being addressed. I mean, obviously, I've been out for a number of years. Um, but it didn't seem to me that uh, by the time that I had left that, that they'd many, made any progress with regard to kind of removing the stigma um, that comes with kind of asking for help. Um, so I, I, hope, I hope that they're trying to address that. And I think if they can address that, then, uh, then there's a chance that um, some of the things that, that people are having to deal with, the kind of homelessness and the, the drug addiction and, and that sort of thing, and of course the, the rash of suicides, um, I hope that that will, that that will be, um, will find a way to, to, to deal with that. Um, but the stigma is a big problem. Hi, uh, Kevin. Um, you said uh, that war is pretty much the, the single worst thing that a person can go through. Um, but you also kind of said that it's um, uh, the pathway to en uh, enlisting is um, quite strong towards family history. Um, so I'm interested in your comments on what tends to elevate the family history um, above the fact that the individuals in your family have pretty much gone through the worst thing that a, right. um, an individual could experience. And following on from that, what would you say if a child of yours um, came to you at age 17 and said, Dad, I want to follow the family history and, and en enlist? Right. Yeah, so, so I think one of, the, one of the problems with that is that um, very often people who, who have been through that experience don't want to talk about it. And they don't talk about it. Um, so what's left is for the sort of following generation as this empty space. And they, 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 they kind of fill in that space themselves. Um, and, and very often, you know, these, just in my own, in my, from my own experience as a, as a kind of young teenager, I had these, ro certainly these romantic, somewhat romantic ideas of, of what, um, what it was really all about. Um, I was naive. Um, but that, that kind of space had been left open for me to, to put those ideas onto the experience, the real experience that people in my family had lived. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's a, and, and that seems to be something that's true probably throughout history is the resistance to, to be open about it um, that allows for the kind of uh, these really stupid, youthful ideas of, of war to, to kind of enter into that, that empty space. And what I would say to my own, uh, you know, I don't have any children, but, um, but you know, I would say that um, I understand that uh, the instinct to, to kind of serve one's fellow citizens is an honorable instinct. I mean, I believe that to be true. I also don't think that the military is the only way that you can kind of uh, satisfy that desire to, to serve one's country or one's uh, fellow citizens. And I think I would make it, I would try to make it 
abundantly clear that um, no one gets out of war unscathed. Um, there's, you know, there will be a profound change one way or the other, and that may be that you come back missing limbs. That may be that you uh, that you have a different, um, you know, that you may become a, an, an angrier person than that you ever thought you could possibly be, or you may be killed, um, and you have to understand that. You know, the problem, one of the problems is that um, it's difficult to, to communicate that to, to a 17-year-old. So, I don't know. There's no easy answer for it, but uh, I, would, I would certainly do my best. Hi. Um, could you tell me if you'd ever go back to Iraq? And if you did, what would you do? Have I ever, or would I ever? Would you ever? You know, I'd love to be able to at some point. Um, I, I don't know that I'd be comfortable uh, as the situation currently is there. But um, no, I, it's. I didn't get to interact with the the people there very often. Um, but the times that I did, I found that they were incredibly warm. Um, given the circumstances, um, in a way that, that was profoundly moving to me. The idea that um, someone could encounter a person who was in their country uh, you know, holding a weapon uh, kind of on their street and, and still have this kind of ability to be compassionate, this ability to, to try to empathize. I, I was profoundly moved by some moments that I had. Um, so I would love to go back and, and experience that country during peacetime and just see what it's really like for the people there. I mean, I, I, I hope that someday I'll be able to do that. Is the gentleman at the front here? Your opening sentence, the opening sentence of any book, I think, is so important. Um, and I thought it was a really beautiful opening sentence and probably one of the best I've read since The Tale of Two Cities. Um, <laughs> but um, my question to you is, because you're a poet, did you write this book as a poet? What, what your use of words and how you approach words when you put your pen to paper, what's the rhythm in your head? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I have a different mindset necessarily when I'm writing poetry or when I'm writing prose. Um, I, I don't kind of consciously turn off one part of my mind and turn on another part. Um, I always try to pay attention to the language, the qualities of the language, so the kind of rhythm and the, the sounds. Um, I have a, a kind of ideal, I suppose, music in my head um, that I'm trying to, to, to capture when I'm, when I'm writing. Um, there are, you know, obviously there, when you're approaching a piece of, of prose, there are other considerations um, that aren't necessarily present when you're working on a poem. I mean, just with respect to the amount of kind of the, the amount of space that you have to work. Um, but uh, you know, the first my first uh, attraction to, to literature was through the, the, the I think the musical the musical qualities of language and writers. Um, you know, when I was twelve, I read Dylan Thomas and was just blown away by the by the music of it. And so that was my first attraction to the written word. And it's something that I still pay attention to. When I read a writer who, who you know, just gets that rhythm, I, uh, you know, that immediately sucks me in. Um, so it, it's something that I pay attention to. I'm not sure how I approach it differently. It's hard for me to kind of step outside of myself and see that. But, uh, but I'm always focused on that, that aspect of, of the writing. 
So there's a gentleman up the back there, and then we'll go to that lady over there in the corner. And then there. So there. <clears throat> Hello, Kevin. Um, I wondered with writing this, the actual writing of it, did it help you deal with any of the demons you had from your experience and how publication and recognition has affected the way it's, it's dealing with your demons? Mm. Um, y yes, in a way. I mean, obviously I had questions that were really important to me and I felt were kind of... Um, necessary. Uh, I, I really needed to, to, to look at the questions that I had as exhaustively as I possibly could. But it's probably also true that I had to kind of come to terms with my own experience before I was really able to approach the material. Um, I mean, I, I, I would never say that I was ever able to approach it objectively, but I needed some, as we talked about earlier, some kind of distance, some kind of, of perspective on it. So, so that kind of had to happen before I could really um, get my hands on the, on the material and, and shape it in the way that I wanted to. Um, but absolutely, there's, a, there's an element of writing, writing the story and, and trying to tackle the questions that I was trying to tackle that um, was satisfying. Um, and I felt like, although I, I didn't, uh, I didn't arrive at any kind of definitive answers, at, at least the questions became more clear to me. Um, and with respect to the, you know, the publication, part of it. Um, I don't know. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I'm not sure that I'm comfortable um, being an advocate in, in that way. Um, I, I, I'm, I tend to be a little uh, just kind of naturally more toward the, the kind of shy, reserved side. Um, I probably think there are people who are better suited to, to being a, an advocate than I am. But uh, I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, I, have, I have had a chance to, to, to meet and talk with a lot of people about real genuine concerns that they have for, for loved ones and things like that. And that's been um, really important to me on a personal level. So uh, yeah, the answer to the second question is you know, I really don't know. I suppose time will tell. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. Um, is that talking? Uh, you spoke of um, guilt and regret and shame and hypervigilance, and these are things that you've had to deal with coming back. And I can maybe following on from the last question, the book has in some way helped you to deal with that. I'm just wondering if there are other effective ways that you know of that people have been able to deal with that? And uh, is there any difference in the way military men and military women will either seek help or not seek help? If there's any uh, statistic about whether military women are more inclined to seek help right. than, than men? Um, so the second part of that question, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, it would be speculation on my part. Um, you know. My instinct would be that, that um, probably military women would be more open to the idea than men. I'm not sure of that, though. Um, so the first part of the question, um, it does seem to me that the most important thing, the, the most important way to, to deal with these issues is to, to, to acknowledge them and to kind of name them, in a way. To, to say that they exist, to say that you're having a problem, just to talk to another person about them. Um, yeah, yeah, just so that they're not locked up inside of you. I mean, I think that's where they do the most damage. Um, if they're just bouncing around inside your head, that's not a good place to be. So it seems to me that the, the most effective step a person can take is just start talking to somebody. Yeah. In anything away to the people who may not have read the book, would what have happened to Mirth, would that be a common occurrence? 
or not? No, it would not be a common occurrence, no. Um, so let me see if I can. Um, there are instances where uh, there have been instances, certainly not exactly like that, but there have been instances where similar sets of circumstances may have happened. Um, but but, but uh, no, I don't know of anything exactly like that. Um, you know, to kind of come up with, uh, with that part of the story, I, I, you know, I pulled on um, some of the, the few instances that, that, I, that I knew about, and then this kind of, um, uh, there's a sort of quality of urban legend about um, some similar situations. Um, and then also just a, uh, I think, a fear that's, that's common for, for soldiers at war. Um, yeah, but it, it, it's definitely not something that would, would be a common occurrence, no. Okay, I think we have one more question, time for one more question. What kind of response have you had from the military authorities? Has there been any hostile reaction to the book? Uh, if there has, they haven't gotten in touch with me. So, um, no, I mean, I, I, no, I don't, I don't know. No, I, I haven't had any um, letters of reprimand or anything like that. So, uh, no, they seem to, to, to have been happy to let me, let me do, do this thing without any in intervention on their part. You couldn't be made a lower rank, could you? Not you anymore, <laughs> no. Right now, I'm, I'm the lowest rank there is, so. Um, no, but, uh, you know. No, I mean, that's not something that, uh, thankfully, that's not something that they typically get involved with. They kind of let people say what they want to say, so. Right, and I think we're all very grateful that that's the case, because um, that was fascinating, uh, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.